hopefully we will do better tomorrow. Um, so, thank you. Ken, this is your first annual. We think you've done a great job. Duplicate five for me, I would be open for that suggestion. Um, right, to introduce Russell Smith, going to give this presentation this morning. Um, in my opinion, Russell's one of the top ten aviation artists in the United States. Um, but uh, he is the vice president of the American Society of Aviation Artists and the League of World War One Aviation Historians. Russell's also a member of the U.S. Air Force Art Collection with paintings in the National Archives. Um, Russell, in, in the aviation world, is at the top of the game. So he will give you a presentation, and it'll be a little different maybe than what you're used to in the Western world, but because of the transportation theme, the aircraft most certainly fit this show. So to turn it over to Russ. Well, thank you. Hey, Russell. of an image, aviation image, more than anything meets the eye. For centuries, um, art has been used as a medium to commemorate historic events. The idea of history as a subject for art is nothing new. The ancient Romans depicted historical events in mosaics and sculpture. This mosaic is from Pompeii and is thought to depict Alexander battling the Persians. Michelangelo gave us the Battle of Cascina. The French neoclassicist David gave us his interpretation of the death of Socrates. And one of my favorites, Polite Verso, by the French academic Jean-Léon Jérôme, depicted the scene that would have taken place 1900 years prior to his having painted this. Now, as we all know, um, the late 20th century has seen uh, a revival of the techniques and values that were practiced by the uh, top, the French art academies in the 19th century. We see more and more artists abandoning the abstract style and coming back to representationalism and thus depicting nature in a way closer to how it actually reveals itself to us rather than in an idealized manner or with hidden meaning. Now, uh, the latter half of the 20th century saw a particularly big surge in the subject matter of aviation in artwork. There was a, a, a surge in the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s uh, where aviation started to become a popular subject. And in the late 80s, a young college art student who had aspirations of being an aeronautical engineer saw this trend and he decided that painting and drawing airplanes would be much more fun and fulfilling than designing them. So he abandoned his dreams of becoming an aeronautical engineer in favor of becoming a studio artist and despite his professor's best attempts to get him to paint abstractly, he clung to his representational style and he continued to draw and paint airplanes and 20 years later, here I am in front of you. Now, I paint airplanes for a living. More specifically, I paint old airplanes. Um, it's funny, when I tell people that, I almost always get the same quizzical look that, I, that my dog gives me when I ask her a question. <laughs> it, it's usually something to the effect of, you paint on airplanes? No, 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 I'm a, I'm a painter, I'm an oil painter, I paint fine art paintings of airplanes, which are collected by collectors and museums around the world. For some reason, people sometimes have a hard time grasping the concept of aviation subjects as artwork. But here's a little tidbit. If I were to mention to you the name Wilson Hurley, everybody in this room knows who that is, one of the top landscape painters of the late 20th century. But did you know that in addition to being one of the top landscape painters, Wilson Hurley was also one of the top aviation artists in the 20th century. This piece called Airstrike in Happy Valley is part of the U.S. Air Force collection. Uh, it hangs on permanent display in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, along with about 10 of his other works uh, in their main gallery. They're all, as you can imagine, just exquisite. 
This is one of my favorites just because the subject matter appeals to me. This is in a private collection. Uh, I'm not sure where it is, but it's called The Sunsets on Werner Voss, depicting the final moves of the German ace Werner Voss. We just drove a half mile over here. Now, as with Western art, in aviation art, um, especially those works that tend to serve as historical narrative, <laughs> aviation art tends to be uh, detail oriented. Uh, aviation, as a rule of thumb by its very nature, is a technical subject. And the history, of course, is, is grounded in factual accuracy. Um, in aviation art, because our clientele tend to be aviation enthusiasts and history buffs, they a lot of times demand that technical and historical accuracy from us. Now, I read an article in American Arts Quarterly about a year ago that described this type of real realism as clinical realism. And it's a type of realism that really only came into its own during the modern age. And it's based on the idea, uh, it's based on uh, the depiction of reality uh, on, com on commonplace facts and the assumption that uh, face value is all that there is for reality. Now, we all know this picture, Washington Crossing the Delaware by Emanuel Gottlieb Lloyds. When I first got out of college, and I was a, a young buck trying to get my art career going, I was showing my work at an air show in the North Carolina area, and I was set up in a kiosk next to another local artist. And this guy, his, his work was okay, it was mediocre, but he took great pride in his technical historical accuracy. And somehow we got on the topic of this painting, and he said to me, you know that painting of Washington Crossing the Delaware? I'd hate to be the guy that painted that. And, well, my curiosity was obviously piqued, so I took the bait and I said, okay, why would you hate to be the guy that painted that? He said, well, look at it. It's almost daylight. Washington wouldn't have been standing up in the boat. He would have been sitting down. And that's not even the Delaware River. That's the Danube River. And I, I don't remember exactly what I said to him, but I know my mental reaction was probably, oh. because I personally would love to be the guy that painted that. It's a beautiful composition. It's well painted, and what a powerful, bold statement that makes. It's one of the most iconic paintings in American history. But I have to thank that guy, because ever since that discussion 20 years ago, I've been mulling over in my head, what does it mean to be accurate? How does one qualify realism? Why does this painting resound on such a, a profound level despite the, all the, quote, inaccuracies with it. Well, the conclusion that I came to, and I think what this guy uh, failed to understand, is that I think there are two other types of accuracy which are far more important to representational art than historical facts or technical facts. The first is visual accuracy. What would your eye and your brain actually perceive in a given situation? And the second is emotional accuracy. What would it feel like to be at that place at that moment? Now, I'm going to touch on these subjects a little more through the course of this presentation. But first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a perpetual student of painting. I love to study paintings of both past and contemporary masters. It would be difficult for me to uh, name all the artists from whom I've drawn inspiration over the years. Some of them are actually sitting in this room. Um, but I'd say in general, my best, my love of aviation subjects is best is expressed through the techniques of the 19th century French art academies. I find, I find an increasing need, however, as I, as I uh, progress through my artistic journey, to augment the analytical creativity of the French art academies with the observational and the creative uh, or intuitive creativity of the modern plein air painters. Now I find the combination of the two styles can really uh, infuse a painting with a sense of, of life and time and place. Now as an artist, I try to strike a fine balance between these four types of accuracy that I'm mentioning to you. Um, I constantly have to be asking myself, how do I provide the necessary facts and information to accurately interpret a scene while at the same time uh, expressing the motion, emotion, and action necessary to achieve a visceral experience? Now, I use two categories to describe my work. 
the first would be aircraft portions, in which the, the purpose of the painting is simply to highlight the most attractive lines and shapes and angles of an aircraft. Uh, if there's a particular setting associated with an aircraft, sometimes I'll indicate that in the background just to place the airplane in the context of its natural setting. Uh, these pieces tend to be a little bit easier in that usually I have unlimited possibilities as to what lines and angles and uh, shapes and I can use for the composition. Now the other category would be historical narratives in which I'm trying to depict a specific event or tell a specific story. Now these tend to be a little bit more difficult in that, that sometimes the facts and the information surrounding the event can limit the amount of creativity you can apply to it. Um, I have to ask myself, what's the climax of the story? When does the drama reach its peak? And find a composition that best expresses that moment. Now, many of you probably aren't aware, but there are several considerations in aviation art that are unique to aviation art that make it particularly challenging. For example, direct access to your subject is often difficult, if not impossible, to come by. Quite often, the only examples available are in dark museums, behind barricades, and you can't get near them. Um, if you do find a flying example, unless you're painting a ground scene, it's impossible to draw or paint your subject from life at altitude. Now, what I would like to do with this presentation is to use a few of my own works to uh, demonstrate how I approach uh, a painting how, and how I address specific issues during the process of creating a painting um, and how I attempt to strike a fine balance between these four types of accuracy that I'm talking about. Now of course this isn't meant to be a, an instructional presentation because I'm very much aware we're all professionals here in this room, all, all of us artists, we all have our own way of doing things and quite a few of you have been doing this a lot longer than I have. but. Um, I find that in hearing someone else talk about their workflow and how they approach um, a, a painting, it helps me to reflect on my own and how I can incorporate new ideas into the process. So hopefully in that regard, it'll be helpful to you. And as for you non-artists in the room, the art collectors, the art enthusiasts, well, honestly, I find that a little education on the part of the collector is never a bad thing. So. Um, I rarely ever follow uh, the same workflow with each painting. I find that each painting tends to be its own entity and requires its own approach in terms of con concept and execution. But in general, I do follow uh, the same general workflow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one painting, uh, one of the paintings I've got in this show actually, to illustrate the general approach. But then as I get to certain issues and certain topics, I'll throw in other paintings uh, to show how I tackle those issues. But before we get started, a history lesson. Oops. On March 9th, 1916, more than 1,000 Mexican horsemen, under the leadership of this man, Pancho Villa, crossed the border and raided the town of Columbus, New Mexico. 17 Americans were killed as they looted and burned the town. And in response, President Woodrow Wilson asked permission from President Carranza of Mexico to send troops into Mexico to chase down Pancho Villa. President Carranza reluctantly agreed under the stipulation that this would only be for the sole purpose of capturing the bandit Pancho Villa. Pershing, uh, excuse me, Wilson ordered a punitive expedition and assigned this man on the right, General John J. Blackjack Pershing, uh, to pursue Pancho Villa's forces. Now Pershing thought that this would be a good opportunity to demonstrate the effectiveness of the airplane in a military operation. And he ordered the man on the left, General Benjamin D. Floyd, or excuse me, Captain Benjamin D. Floyd, to take the first aero squadron to Columbus, New Mexico to join the punitive expedition. The first aero squadron uh, arrived in Columbus on March 15th with only eight Curtis J and three Jennies, 11 pilots, and 82 enlisted men. They flew their first reconnaissance sortie on the 16th, which marked the first time an American aircraft was used in a military operation. In addition, the squadron's marking, the red star on the rudder, was the first example of a national insignia on a U.S. aircraft. 
on March 19th, four days after their arrival in Columbus, the squadron was ordered to report without delay to Pershing's headquarters in Casa Grande, Mexico. The pilots departed early that evening. Uh, but having a little night flying experience, the darkness proved to be a major problem for them. Only one airplane made it to headquarters that night. The next day, two more aircraft landed. One airplane had returned to Columbus and two others were missing. But they soon discovered that they had bigger problems than darkness. Uh, their 90 horsepower engines lacked sufficient power to allow, allow them to climb over the 10 to 12,000 foot peaks. Strong turbulent winds in the passes made it impossible for them to fly through the mountain passes. Uh, frequent dust storms wreaked havoc with their engines, making it almost impossible to fly, and the heat delaminated their wooden propellers. Now, because of all these problems, many, many of their missions just couldn't be accomplished. Captain Floy uh, reported to General Pershing that the Jennings were not capable of meeting the present military service conditions. Uh, but regardless, he continued to do what he could with what he had. Uh, it was decided that the planes would be used for reconnaissance and to carry mail and official dispatches between ground units. By April, the squadron was down to two flyable airplanes and thus was ordered to go back to Columbus, New Mexico. When they arrived, Captain Floyd ordered that the remaining two Jennies be set on fire so that no one could order him to fly them again. <laughs> the first attempt by a U U.S. military air unit was, could be considered a failure, but in actuality, it was a great learning experience. Uh, although they were unsuccessful in finding Pancho Villa, uh, Captain Floyd considered this a turning point in Amer American military aviation. The numbers supported his opinion. During this first U.S. military air action, the first aero squadron flew 346 hours uh, on 540 flights and covered almost 19,000 miles, performing aerial reconnaissance and photography and transporting mail and official U.S. dispatches. More importantly, uh, despite the failures of the first U.S. Air Squadron, uh, the military learned that the airplane could no longer be considered an oddity, but was actually a useful military tool. Now, let's get on with my process. Uh, when Ken called me, uh, I guess it's been two and a half years ago, and told me about this idea he had for a show, uh, <clears throat> of course the first thing I had to do, I, well the first thing I did was say, heck yeah, I'm interested, count me in. But after that, I had to come up with a, a, a story to tell. I had to come up with an idea that could tie early aviation in with the West. Well, being somewhat of an expert on early aviation, uh, my mind immediately went to the first aero squad. Now, of course, one of the first things an artist has to do when uh, creating a painting or a composition is to come up with a series of thumbnail sketches. Now, I don't spend a lot of time on my thumbnail sketches trying to get lines and proportions right. Uh, because at this stage, I'm really just working quickly. The goal here is to, is to draw airplanes, but really what I'm doing is I'm trying to come up with an attractive abstract pattern. Um, as many of you know, in order for a composition to work, the underlying abstract form of the painting has to be strong. This holds true even with representational art. Our brain takes in this abstract pattern on a subconscious level before your eyes can even begin to interpret detail. Um, if the abstract form of a painting, the underlying abstract form is weak, then the composition won't hold together. Now, in addition to my abstract forms here, I'm also trying to tell a story and tell it concisely. Now, this is something that was driven home to me early in my career. I was taking a workshop from a well-known aviation artist named Gil Cohen. And one of our assignments prior to the class was to work up a series of thumbnail sketches, which we would then bring into class, and we would work on developing one into a larger story. Well, I was a young hockey artist at the time, and I worked up my thumbnail sketches, and I just thought, whoa, these are the greatest thing in the world. Gil's going to be blown away by these. He's going to carry me around the room on his shoulders, which would have been kind of funny, because Gil's about that tall. But uh, something very different happened. I got to Gil's class, and his comment, he looked at my thumbnail sketches and goes, what are you trying to say? What Gail was trying to tell me was that a painting, for the most part, should be self-explanatory. We all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. Any person 
uh, or any, any person, regardless of their knowledge of the subject or what's in the painting, should be able to walk up to a painting and get a general idea of what's going on there. Now, uh, I spoke to you a minute ago about visual accuracy. Let me jump back just there. Uh, amateur artists sometimes make the mistake of painting what they expect to see rather than what they would actually see. Um, certain details may be important in that they provide the viewer with the necessary information to accurately interpret an image, but some other details uh, might be better if left, uh, uh, if, if they're not rendered sharply, uh, if they're left to the viewer's imagination. This is what's referred to as suggestive information. Now, I'm easily bored with paintings that overload the viewer with too much information all at once because the brain can only take in and process so much at one time. I find that the best paintings are those that reveal themselves slowly um, and engage the viewer for long periods of time. I think that the longer the viewer is engaged with your painting, the more lasting the painting's impact is going to be with the viewer. Uh, we, we strive, we as artists, we strive to design our compositions with a visual hierarchy uh, so that the viewer's eye goes to one primary location and then is drawn through and around the composition um, uh, and slowly so that uh, the, the viewer can take in the painting on a, on a slow level. And by emphasizing certain details while at the same time de-emphasizing others, we can engage the viewer in sort of a hide-and-go-seek. Um, thus allowing the viewer to become a participant. Now I also talked to you about emotional accuracy. Of the four types of accuracy that I, I mentioned, this is probably the hardest to define. And the reason for that is that the emotional reaction is a uniquely individual experience. How one person in, um, reacts to a situation might be completely different to how another person reacts. Now any person can sit down and trace a photograph and in doing so can produce a drawing that would be technically accurate, but it would lack soul and emotion of an actual experience. Uh, one example that I really like comes from Tolstoy, where he talks about two men sitting down at the end of their day and they're telling each other about their day, and one simply reiterates a series of facts, but the other one recounts the facts but adds emphasis and emotion and exaggeration so that he's providing facts and emotion. Now one example um, that I can use that um, is personal to me is in 2007 and 2009, my wife and I were fortunate to be able to travel down to New Zealand to meet one of my clients and to see some of the really terrific World War I reproduction airplanes that are being built down there by a company called the Vintage Aviator. Now on our second trip, we got to spend an entire day out of their airfield going for rides and playing around the airplanes and taking pictures and at the end of the day, they put on a flying display with these three very accurate World War I SE-5s. And as the pilots were climbing into their planes, I grabbed my camera and I staked out a spot on this guy's wingtip. And these pilots cranked up the engines and suddenly it became this really visceral moment for me. It was full of sights and sounds and smells and colors. And there was even this physical throb that I could feel through my body as these engines hummed to life. Um, that experience, it stuck with me for several years to the point that last year, I finally decided to get this out of my head and get it on canvas. And so what I did was I took that situation, my experience, and I translated it into a 1918 setting. Now this is what I'm talking about when I talk about emotional accuracy. Now obviously, I'm not actually there to experience my paintings firsthand. This was an exception. But what do you do in lieu of that? Well, I think just as a method actor has to place himself into a part, a lot of times we actors have to mentally put ourselves into a scene and imagine what it would have been like to be on the ground or, or be in that situation. Going back to the first Aero Squadron piece, once I found the thumbnail that I liked, um, I developed it into a larger sketch, which would then serve as a rough value map for me. Um, I, I came up with this idea of the airplanes on the ground in Casa Grandes, Mexico, and I tried to imagine, I imagined a similar situation where we're on the ground and the engines are cranking up and it becomes a, this, this, this vis visceral moment. We're, uh, we're off this guy's wingtip, off his right wingtip, and about eye level with the lower wingtip or lower edge, leading edge there. Um, 
the ground crew are pulling out the chocks as the pilot advances the throttle on his big OX6 engine, and, and as a result, the air is just being filled with dust and, and dirt, and there's a lot of action going on here. Now, I would actually end up flipping this composition um, so that the plane, so that we see the pilot side of the plane rather than the crewman side. And here's a little bit of trivia uh, for you Western <coughs> folks. Do you know why aviation folks don't say anything? <laughs> Do you know why a pilot gets in his plane on the left side, on the port side? Exactly. Very good. That's the side you mount a horse from. In early aviation, uh, a lot of the pilots came from the cavalry. And so naturally, you know, you, you mount a horse on the left side, so they've naturally mounted their plane on the left side. But anyway, going on, let me jump to the subject of aerial scene for just a moment. Uh, with aviation subjects, we have a unique challenge in that we often have to consider time and motion uh, when creating an aerial scene. Um, and this is due to the fact that our subjects are usually moving in an unrestricted manner uh, and very quickly we have to kind of ask ourselves where will the subject be five seconds from now and compose the scene so that the airplane can get there freely. Uh, this becomes especially important in scenarios where there are a lot of uh, airplanes involved, like I sometimes have in my, my World War I paintings. And what I do in a case such as that is once I get the initial idea down on paper, I'll test the positioning of the aircraft using the scale models. Um, this is a piece I did several years ago involving a head-on pass uh, with two airplanes and what I did was I took these models outside and I set them up on an armature and uh, and this helped me to to be able to get a good idea of the relative sizes of the aircraft their directions and how close you know whether they were whether or not they were going to be able to pass in close proximity to one another um, it basically just helped me to visualize whether this was going to work or not and this was the resulting painting from that. This is called The Eagle and the Butterfly, and it shows the first time uh, Manfred von Richthofen, in the Red Baron, was shot down. He was actually shot down twice in his career. Now let me talk about drawing the aircraft for a moment. This would be the next step. Once I have a, a, a rough value map laid out, I have to create a detailed perspective drawing of each airplane in the scene. Now we all know the two types of perspective. There's atmospheric perspective and there's linear perspective. Atmospheric perspective is the optical solution for creating the illusion of space characterized by the, the uh, gradation of line, color, and value. Linear perspective, on the other hand, is a mathematical and quantifiable solution for creating the illusion of space. In order to create, uh, in order to, to get uh, a correct linear perspective in a painting, uh, I don't draw from models because at the small scale of a model, slight inconsistency in my eye position can translate into a big inconsistency on a painting. Models also don't take into consideration the various flight characteristics of the surfaces of the aircraft. Um, I also don't draw directly from photos because with a photo I'm limited to the view that the photographer has given me. And also, with a, photo, with a photo, the focal distance of the camera rarely ever matches the necessary viewing distance of the painting. And thus what happens is the perspective looks forced due to lens distortion. What I do is I use a method of isometric drawing, uh, which allows me to create a fixed, uh, a, a accurate 3D drawing from a fixed viewpoint. Now, isometric drawing, in case you don't know, is an artistic tool for creating a linear perspective in a two-dimensional space. Based on Euclidean geometry, isometric drawing has been around since the Renaissance. Uh, artists such as uh, Alberti, Masaccio, Brunelleschi, and even most notably Leonardo da Vinci experimented with this scientific approach to drawing. Um, in later centuries, it was developed even further with the introduction of two and three point perspective. And then in the 1880s, uh, the American artist Thomas Eakins uh, penned what's probably the most definitive manuscript on the subject. And the uh, methods which he outlined in his book are still relevant to contemporary representational artwork. Now there are several approaches to isometric drawing. Uh, the, the approach I use is called projective geometry. Uh, and projective geometry, what it does is it, it simulates the sight size method of drawing where the subject is drawn at the same size as the object as it is viewed. 
The main difference is that with projective geometry, the subject is theoretical, whereas with sight size drawing, the subject is actual. This is the layout that I used uh, to create my drawing. Um, I figured up, I did some number crunching, and I figured up that a position, a viewpoint approximately 45 feet off the Jenny's lower wing would give me the perspective I needed for my painting. And this was the resulting drawing from that layout. Um, and following on that, this is the drawing with the second perspective drawing, the second airplane drop in. Once I have the perspective drawings worked out to my liking, I'll scan them and place them in Photoshop. Um, I work a lot in Photoshop in the preliminary stages just because it gives me the freedom to move elements around individually uh, and manipulate them as I need them. Now let me jump subjects for a second and talk about figures. Uh, from a creative point of view, adding figures into a painting makes it exponentially more difficult. Um, on one hand, figures give the viewer a psychological bridge by which they can more easily connect to a painting. Um, <clears throat> When figures are involved, the eye naturally gravitates towards them. We all want to know what they're doing. The human figure is always interesting. This becomes particularly true when there's a situation of an interaction between two figures because that creates um, a natural point of interest. When you introduce figures into a painting, you open up a whole new set of considerations. Uh, the first being the language of gesture and expression. Stage actors will tell you that uh, when trying to convey an emotion on stage, sometimes they have to overact a little bit in order to get the point across. On the same note, sometimes when you're putting a figure in a painting, sometimes it helps to over-exaggerate the figure's gesture just slightly to get the idea across. You also have to consider the double purpose of figures as they can be, as they can be used both to tell the story and to create a compositional uh, element or mass. And the third thing you have to take into consideration is that small nuances in the placement or a gesture of a figure can make or break a painting. And here's a good example. This is a piece I did several years ago called Starting Line. The bottom image is the final painting. The top image is the color of the study I did for that painting. Now look at this guy right here on the right. He's walking towards you, and now that I've pointed him out to you, you can't look away from him. Now why is that? It's because he's looking at you, he's confronting you, and so naturally your eye goes over there. He's a distraction. Well, I needed that vertical element over here. I needed that, uh, that, that, that element on this side to stop your eye from going out of the painting. So what I did was in the actual painting, I simply rotated him 90 degrees so that he's looking into the painting now. I still have that element over there. I still have that visual mass, but he's no longer a distraction. Um, figures, they give a composition both an organic flow and a sense of life, but of course your figures have to be convincing. Uh, the smallest error in a figure just stands out like a spotlight. Not everybody can spot a perspective uh, problem with a plane, or believe it or not, not everybody can spot an a anatomy problem with a horse, but everyone knows if a figure is co incorrect. Uh, the human brain is finely attuned to what the human figure looks like, that, what, what the human figure looks like, and if there's the slightest problem, your viewer immediately knows it. Now, I'm going to confess to y'all, I am cheap, all right? Um, so quite often, instead of hiring a model, what I'll do is I'll go out in my backyard, I've got a collection of uniforms at home, and I'll put on a uniform and start posing while my wife takes photos. Um, and then I'll go back in, as I'm doing the drawings, I'll change the faces up and change the proportions some. Um, the exception to that would be if I have a lot of figures in a painting, I will bring in extra models just so the painting doesn't look like Attack of the Clones or anything like that. <laughs> now I'm going to move on to color studies. Now once I'm satisfied with the placement of all my elements in a painting, it's time to create a color study. Now the idea of a color study means different things to different artists. To some people, it simply means a small thumbnail sketch in color. My color studies tend to be a little bit larger and are basically just small, less detailed versions of the larger paintings. Working quickly on this scale helps me to figure out exactly what colors need to go where, how intense or muted they need to be, and basically just uh, spot any issues early in the small stage before I commit myself to a larger painting. 
Uh, most importantly, though, uh, this serves as just another stage where I can check the values uh, in the painting, only this time with the extra consideration of color factored in. Now, my color studies are painted plein air whenever possible. But once again, access to these aircraft is often difficult, if not impossible, to come by. So how do you solve that problem? Well, I solved it once again by using uh, scale models. What I do is, I, with the plein air method, is I uh, go outside in the appropriate conditions uh, with the model right in front of me, mounted on this homemade armature here. <coughs> and uh, I paint uh, with the appropriate lighting necessary. Now this is something I really just started in the last couple of years, um, and, but it's really proven to be a great learning experience for me. Um, it allows me to collect the necessary data that might be missing or distorted in a photo. Um, I was scared, I was intimidated by the idea of it first because it was something that I've never tried before, but I've really kind of gotten addicted to it to be honest with you. Um, this is the model that I used for the Jenny painting. Um, there are a lot of things that I've learned uh, painting plein air. For starters, it's all about establishing and interpreting correct value relationships. Now, when we think of paintings, we tend to think in terms of color, but it's actual value that does the lion's share of the work in a painting. Um, I heard an artist named Brian Nair recently say that value is the stage upon which color performs. Correct value relationships in a painting uh, are key to establishing a good sense of light in representational art. If your value relationships are correct, then your painting will likely look correct even if your palette isn't literally accurate to the subject. Another thing I've learned is you have to be general. You have to glance at your subject. You don't stare. If you stare at one spot too long, your eye adjusts itself to the value range of that spot and thus it throws off the relation of the values and contrast in that spot to those of the larger picture. Um, I also have to take into account several special considerations when I'm uh, painting models like this. For instance, if I'm painting in my yard and I see green reflected up on the bottoms of the wings of the airplane, I know that's the green of my grass in the yard. Or if I see trees reflected along the fuselage, I know that's probably the trees at the edge of my yard reflecting off the model. But if in my final painting, the aircraft is supposed to be 8,000 feet, I know you're not gonna see the grass in my yard reflected off the bottom of the plane, and you're not gonna see trees reflected off the fuselage. So I have to take that into consideration. Another thing I have to think about is at this small scale, at say 1 32nd scale, uh, the gap between the wings may only measure three inches. But on the actual airplane, it might measure more like five feet. Obviously five feet is going to let in a lot more light than three inches will, so I have to kind of compensate for that. Um, now this is the color study that I did for the first Aero Squadron painting, and let me tell you now, I consider this a mess, but I'm going to explain that uh, in just a few minutes. Right now I'm going to jump on the um, painting itself. Now uh, it's time to work, start work on the actual finished product. Um, now at this stage, uh, my next step can go one of two ways. Uh, on simpler compositions such as this, this is another piece I've got hanging in the show up here. Uh, on simpler compositions where adjustments can be made relatively easily, what I usually do is start with a stained canvas to knock down the bright white of the canvas and to give it an overall color tone, and then I'll jump directly into color. On more complicated compositions, they tend to require a little more work if you find you need adjustments along the way, so I'll back up and take uh, smaller incremental steps, baby steps to get there. And so what I do on more complicated compositions is as an intermediary step, I'll create a grise layer uh, to basically just establish my values once again and make sure that everything's translating from the smaller scale to the larger scale. A lot of the artists in this room know that sometimes when you move from the small scale to the large scale, it doesn't translate like you thought it was going to. So this allows me to check it in that manner. Um, once this is dry, I'll go straight into color. Um, my grise layer usually uh, consists of either raw umber and white or burnt um, umber and white, depending on which color tone I'm going for. Uh, this was the grise layer for the first Aero Squadron painting. Um, you'll notice that I also added a stand of trees in the background here. Uh, if you remember what the drawing I showed you a few minutes ago, there, was no tree, there were no trees. I added a stand of trees because I came across this picture. 
of the first aero squadron at Casa Grandes in Mexico, and my thought was, oh, if I put these trees in, then that will tie it to a specific location, and it will be a nice compositional element. Um, that decision would come back to bite me in the butt later, um, as I'll show you in just a minute. My next step after the grise layer is start on my color. Um, once the values is, are established, I'll start blocking that in. Now, with or without the grise layer, this is basically just a color underpainting. Uh, I'm really just trying to be very general and very loose with this layer. Uh, in fact, I'm, in some areas, I'm really only scrubbing in color the way a child would yield a crayon. Uh, just really loose. I'm only trying to ba establish the basics of form, value, and color here. And my main concern is just capturing a good feel, a good sense of light, um, and imbuing the painting with a sense of light and atmosphere. Leaving out small details at this stage helps me to just focus on the big picture, on the bigger elements, uh, rather than getting caught up in singular details. Now, something I've started doing lately in the past couple of years is I've started painting with my tabouret between me and the easel, and this forces me back so that I have to paint at arm's length. Uh, I know some artists who do paint with their noses in the painting, and to me, you can't see the big picture when you're working like that. I'm also a big proponent of standing to paint um, because this allows me to step back more freely and view the picture from farther away whenever I need to uh, so that I can monitor the progress of the overall image. Uh, I can still lean over and, and paint details whenever I need to. Now, throughout the process of painting, I keep a, a Facebook page for my studio where I can keep people updated to what I'm working on, where I'm at at each project, um, when I'm going to be releasing what image. And I had this going, and I posted this bottom image on here as part of the work in progress. And somebody came back and said, well, I don't recall there being trees in the area where the first Aero Squadron flew. Um, well, we artists have those moments, you know, when you've been working diligently on a painting, and you think you've got everything perfect, and somebody comes along and insinuates. They have the gall to insinuate that something isn't quite right. And, of course, your first reaction is, well, Leave me alone. What do you know? Go away, you Philistine. How, how dare you question me? But, you know, I practiced restraint, and I simply responded. I, I showed the man, once again, this picture, and I explained to him where it was taken and why I included the trees. And I went to bed smug that night, thinking that I had shut him up. Well, the next morning, I woke up with a sinking feeling, uh, because it dawned on me what the guy was trying to tell me. The painting no longer felt like a desert. It no longer had that dry desert feel of Mexico. And I knew uh, that, you know, people can question technical and historical stuff, but if somebody says to you, this doesn't look right, or this doesn't feel like right, you don't brush them off. Uh, I think it was Norman Rockwell who one time said something to the effect of, even if my dog looks at it funny, I know I need to change something. <laughs> so I grabbed the color study and I started schlocking paint all over it. And that's why this is kind of messy, but I had to, I had to make sure that where I was going with this, with this next step was going to work. And I painted out the trees. Um, now, now comes round two of color. Uh, this is the stage where the painting really begins to take on its final form. Um, at this stage, uh, I begin fine-tuning the colors and the values and adding or, if necessary, obscuring details. Now, generally speaking, I try to give the most definition to the subject and the areas around the subject. And that includes saturated edges or saturated colors, the greatest areas of contrast, and my most refined edges. Uh, this goes back to the theory of uh, visual accuracy that I spoke of. Um, the eye can't focus on more than one area or subject at a time. When you look at an object, uh, do you see everything around it in detail? You don't. You see the object in detail. But as other objects around it move out of the cone of vision and into the periphery, they begin to lose definition. Um, the use of too many hard edges in a painting uh, diminishes the illusion of reality. This is what's referred to as selective focus. Uh, and the term selective focus simply refers to the sharp rendering of the subject while other, uh, other objects around it um, become more obscure as they move towards the edges. By following that principle, uh, you can provide the viewer with multiple points of focus that have a diminishing hierarchy of detail, edge, value, and color. 
And that hierarchy is what helps establish the, the path that the eye will follow around the painting. Now I've kept the Jenny fairly well um, defined here since, it, since it's the subject. Uh, at the same time, I'm incorporating various artistic devices uh, to uh, round out the forms and uh, emphasize some areas while at the same time de-emphasizing others. I've incorporated what's called lost edge in the ropes and the wheel chops and the propeller to give it a real sense of movement. Uh, along those same lines in this piece, um, on this piece I had in mind that we're uh, moving along with the airplane here, with the airplane and train, so that our relative speed is almost zero with them. So everything with those two is sharply defined. But I wanted to give a sense of speed. So I wanted nothing in that foreground to hold your eyes. So I kept it very loose and painterly. Uh, so that it would give a real sense of movement. Uh, back on the first Aero Squadron piece, I kept the car in the background somewhat well defined since it's kind of a solid shape and its lines are pretty solid. But in the figures, I've kept them kind of loose and organic uh, because I didn't want them to distract your eye. And one technique that artists in the past have used in a situation like this is they keep the faces undefined so that they don't draw your eye. So that the figures now simply become an organic mass uh, rather than an actual figure. Uh, my palette consists of warm and cool versions of the three primaries, plus a warm and cool violet. I love violet. Um, and I also add in a warm and cool orange whenever necessary. Rembrandt is my brand of choice. I really like Rembrandt paints. I also like the Vasari line of grays that uh, Scott Christensen developed, although I do find they darken slightly as they dry. Um, Brushes, I like the Robert Simmons uh, Signet line of hogs hair brushes, and no, I I'm not getting a paid endorsement for saying that. I just like them because they're inexpensive, they're durable, and they push paint around really well. <clears throat> I don't necessarily always use a brush. Sometimes the best effect can be, can be gained by just using my finger, or maybe even a palette knife. Now, throughout the process, it's critical that I continue to judge the work objectively. Uh, I continuously step back from the easel uh, so that I can view the painting from farther away uh, so that the lesser elements uh, begin to disappear and I can assess the painting simply by the major compositional forms. It's also beneficial for me to look at my work in different ways. Turn the painting upside down, take it into a different room, uh, whatever works. My favorite method of, of alternate viewing though is simply a mirror. <clears throat> I have a mirror mounted over my drawing table about eight feet behind me from where I stand when I paint so that any time during the process all I have to do to check my work is that. And another benefit of that is it also doubles the distance between me and the painting if you figure that I have to look that way and then the reflection has to come back this way. And as Alberti pointed out, a mirror is a good judge for you to have. Uh, it's marvelous how every weakness in a painting is so clearly revealed by a mirror. Well. Another uh, good way to check it is take a black and white photo. Uh, this helps me to check and make sure my values are balanced. Some people use what's called a black mirror for this, but honestly, I've never gained anything from a black mirror. When I look in a black mirror, all I see are darker colors. So <clears throat> I like to take a black and white photo. Well, here we are at the finished product. Fledgling Air Force, depicting the first Aero Squadron's involvement in the Mexican punitive expedition of 1916. Racing the Iron Compass, depicting a Beach 17 stagger wing racing a Santa Fe Super Chief across the western landscape. And as a little trivia here, the title Iron Compass comes from the fact that back in the early days of aviation, when pilots were flying across the west, sometimes uh, they'd lose themselves over featureless landscapes. So they'd find a railroad track and look for it on the map to help them figure out their direction and their heading, and thus the term Iron Compass. And finally, neither rain nor dark of night, depicting a U.S. Postal Service DH-4. Uh, this particular plane hangs on display in the U.S. Postal Service Museum in Washington, D.C. Well, that's it. Do I have any questions? Anybody have any questions?